Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, if you want to uh, follow along, uh, before we get to the word, uh, we'll be in Psalm 70, 78. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm uh, 78. We'll also be kind of all over the place this morning, um, as hopefully we'll do something fun together, which is basically cover almost the whole Bible today. Y'all in? Y'all game? Sounds great, Tracy says. That's awesome. Um, one of the things that, uh, that you may or may not notice about uh, life in like a modern world, I don't know if y'all know this, we all live in a modern world. We have a, a, a very distinctly modern moment that we're living in. Um, and um, one of the things that that doesn't make tons of time for or room for um, is something that I love, which is being nostalgic. I, I cannot tell you, I may be the most nostalgic person that I've ever met. I mean, the amount of like, the amount of trinkets and things that I ascribe meaning to, I'm talking like instantly and then hold on to them forever. I mean, I have a whole like, you know, box in this storage unit that I have. And if you ever send me or write me a letter or a note, like it's, it's like basically God's word to me. Um, and so um, what, it, what a modern world doesn't allow for is the time and the space to think back. Um, we don't look back very often. Uh, we usually are so consumed by and so concerned with the things that are right in front of us or the things that are uh, coming in the future for us. So we are very often looking around us in the current moment, or we're looking forward to something in the future. And what I want to say is that is good and right. Uh, We just sang about how we are waiting for the return of Jesus, and we are anticipating, like the, the, the final words of Scripture say, Maranatha, like, come, Lord. Like, we are waiting for you. To, to make this right. Um, one of the things I want to point out, though, in that, and this is where we'll be today, is that if we're not careful, if we're only looking forward and we're only looking around us, we are so prone to forget and to not remember the things that have happened before us. And I, I say that not only as someone who studied history for a very long time. I have a history degree from the University of Memphis, and I spent a lot of money learning this fact that, that when you look back, like that is a deeply formative and deeply important thing that we do as we look back to the past to, in some sense, anchor us for the present moment and then teach us about the future. And so what I thought we would do uh, today is see that pattern play itself out in, in Scripture. God actually commands that his people remember and set aside time and moments and seasons, festivals and parties and all kinds of things, specifically to do that one thing, to look back in the past and to remember what the Lord had done for them in the past. And so if you have a copy of God's Word, I hope that you do. Let's go to Psalm uh, 78, and we'll begin reading there. And so what I want to do here is just uh, is just introduce this concept and just kind of show it to you in the scriptures that God actually does want us to, 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 to remember the works of the Lord. And then what we'll do is, is just for the, for the next period of our time, we'll just consider what, what, what is meant here by the works of God. What does it mean that God has done works on our behalf? And we'll just remember them. And so if you're new to church, if you didn't grow up, like this, this could feel like I know there's some old Sunday school teachers in the in the uh, in the in the room. I myself uh, never was a Sunday school teacher. I did teach one time in the fifth grade though. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we were we were Sunday school folks. Like that's kind of what we did. And so if you're here and and everything that I'm going to tell you today, you've heard before. I just have this word of caution. There's uh, one of my favorite hymns. is called "I Love to Tell the Story." And the Alan Jackson version is the best. <laughs> and thank you. It is the best. That whole album, y'all. Let me just plug that whole album for a second. I think it's called like Church Songs or something. But anyway, it's really good. Um, 
there's a line in there that is, is, is going to capture exactly what I'm trying to say here, which is, I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And what I'll submit to you, if you have heard about the stories of Abraham and the stories of Moses and the stories of David, and you're thinking, yeah, 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 no, I know all that. I know all that. What I would submit to you is that you are in danger of just focusing on the present moment and not thinking about the past and thinking about the, way that's the, the ways that the Lord has been faithful to his promises. And so um, that, that's, that's for you. That's kind of a, let, let, let's lean in. Let's lean in together. And uh, I'm also not naive to the fact that, and there are some folks in here who just don't feel that, that versed in the story of Scripture. They don't feel that knowledgeable. They, they would say that, man, I don't really know enough. Like, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand. There's so much that's happening in this story. It's kind of confusing. And I would say that, yes, like there are lots of moving parts of the story. But what I want to walk us through today is what I would just say is uh, a, a, a deeply significant way to think about the whole Bible as it unfolds as a story. The whole Bible as it unfolds as a story. So let's read this. Psalm 78, starting in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable, and I will utter dark sayings of old, things that we have heard and things that we have known, that our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, that they should be like their fathers, that they should not be like their fathers." a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. So would y'all mind, let's just pray together. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. And so, Father, here we are. Here is your word before us, and you have promised us that your word will never return void. And so here we are with with all of our hearts just laid bare before you, your word says. You know all of the details of our lives, and yet here we are. Here we are, and we trust you with that. We trust you. We ask that your spirit would take these words and that he would, he would put them on our hearts, and that those hearts would burn, and that they would, they would, they would be on fire and like lit, lit ablaze for the person of Jesus. He is uh, the answer to all of our needs. He is the fulfillment of all of your promises. He is our deepest joy, and we just ask that you would show him to us this morning. That's what we need. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so here we see it. We see that God is commanding his people to tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. Why? So they don't forget them. So they don't forget them. I mean, I don't know about you. I am so prone. Like, it's like I have amnesia sometimes with certain things. Forget, I mean, forget things that actually matter. I'm talking like things like I have lost the same set of truck keys 10,000 times. We're, I am one of the most forgetful people when it comes to things like that. We're so forgetful as people. We are so forgetful as people. And what I want to see, what I, want, what I want us to kind of lean into is that this is a feature of what it means to be in a fallen world with fallen hearts that need to be redeemed. All through Scripture, you see this pattern emerge where God's people are delivered out of some evil thing or they themselves have rebelled against the Lord God comes in as the Redeemer. He saves them, 
And then the very next story, the very next passage, the very next iteration, the very next scene of the story, they've forgotten. They've forgotten, and we're back in the same place. So if you, like me, are already kind of um, wondering, like, why I'm even talking about any of this stuff, I would just encourage you to say, it's because we forget, we're forgetful. It's because we're forgetful. And, and y'all, like, we are forgetful and also actively prone to not look back on the past and to think about the ways that the, that the Lord has been faithful in his, in his, uh, to his promises and to his people. <clears throat> so what I thought we would do is, is, is just walk through the works of God. What does it mean to, to think about the works of God? Um, and I would submit that it's this. I would submit that it's this. The story of the whole Bible is that God will save his people. The story of the whole scripture is that God will save his people. That could be like, um, it's kind of like, imagine, um, imagine that you see far away, you see that there is like this white box. You see it probably 100 feet away. And then you walk closer to this box and then you realize, oh my gosh, is that a, that's, that's a book. Okay, so now I see it was a white box, and now the closer that I get, it's like, it's like a book. And then you get closer and closer, and then all of a sudden you're reading this, this story. This is like that. So the 30,000-foot the, 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 the 30, view is that what God is doing from the very beginning until the very end of this book, of these stories, these collection of narratives, is he is saving his people. He's saving his people. So in in the in the um, in kind of the 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 theological formation that we talk about. So I don't I don't know if you consider yourself a student of the Bible, or I don't know if you consider yourself a theologian. I would just tell you you do have theology. You sitting in this room, no matter how little you think you know or how much you feel like you know, you are a theologian. You have thoughts about God and an experience with the world that God has made. And there's a uh, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's by A.W. Tozer, who says, what comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What comes to your mind when you think about who God is, that, 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 that thought, those sets of realities for you, they're the most important thing about you. And yet, for so many of us, myself included, those thoughts, those realities affect so little of my actual life. So little sometimes. In other countries, um, in other religions actually, this is actually uh, uh, very predominant in Islam. I was able to spend some months in Istanbul, Turkey when I was in college. It was one of the most powerful um, experiences I've ever had. It was awesome. I'd love to tell you all about it. I do love stories. Uh, especially ones that have to do with Turkey. So what I learned is, is in a Muslim culture, you, 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 when you meet someone new, the first thing that you do is tell them the most important thing about you. The first thing you say to someone, you don't make casual conversations with people that you meet for the first time. You tell them the most important things about who you are, which is why the greeting in Islam, the greeting in Arabic has a built in that God is great. You see that? Like built into their language even is, is we're going to communicate about the things that matter to us the most. And so what comes to your mind when you think about God, it's the most important thing about who you are. I would submit to you that that is true. I don't know whether in your experience you think that it's true or you feel like it's true or that you live as if it's true, but I would just tell you it is true. It is true. And it's tricky because there's another theologian that I love who will remain nameless just because it's not worth naming. It's kind of one of those deals. Who says this? He says that you cannot have a knowledge of God. Follow me here. You cannot have a knowledge of God without a knowledge of self. You cannot have a knowledge of God with a knowledge of self. And, and here's what he doesn't mean. Because we, we in, our today, in our modern kind of world, are set up not just to think about the present and the future. We are, we are consumed by self. We're consumed by self. We're consumed with, with a knowledge of self. So much of our, of our world says what you ought to do, the reason that you're here, 
the purpose for your life is to look inside of your heart and find whatever desires are there and then express those desires. Do you follow that? You see that play out in a thousand different ways. The goal or the point of life, what it means to flourish according to a modern world is to find out whatever is in here. What, 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 what am I like? What is my identity? Like, what am I finding on my identity in? I'm gonna look into myself and I'm gonna find those desires and I'm gonna express those. And expressing those desires is the most important thing that I can be doing. This guy is not saying that. We, we, we would say, Christians would say that that is a non-gospel. That is a false gospel. We're not looking into our own hearts to find desires that we should express, although they are there. But when they're there, when we're born, we're born into a fallen world and we're born with deceived hearts. And those desires must be redeemed and must be, uh, must be transformed into the image of Christ. And so he's not saying a knowledge of self that leads to, uh, to, to uh, what am I trying to say? To just self-fulfillment or, or something like that. Instead, what he's saying is, we must see that the knowledge of who God is is contrasted, contrasted with who we are as creatures. He's saying that we are creatures and we cannot know God unless we know that he is our creator. We cannot know God unless we know that we are not God. And so there, there's a humility that's built into that. There's an acknowledgement that man, if I'm going to know you, God, if I'm going to know and experience you, if I'm going to enjoy life with you, if I'm going to live into the world that you've made, I must acknowledge that you have the authority to say and to tell me what life is like, what truth is. You define the reality that I'm going to live into. It's a built-in humility. You cannot have a knowledge of God without a knowledge of self. He also says this, that you can't actually know yourself unless you know God. You cannot know yourself unless you know God. You, in this room, have been created by God, for Him. You've been made from Him and through Him and to Him, are all things the Word says. There's a, there's a, um, a really popular practice in church history where churches and whole denominations will essentially take all of the things that they want their specific denomination to believe and to know, and that they package them in a question and answer format. It's called a catechism. I love these things. They're awesome. Heidelberg Catechism is the best, um, but that's not the one I'm talking about now. I'm talking about the Westminster Confession of Faith. And so this Westminster Confession of Faith starts and says, what is the chief end of man? Why are we here? What is the point of all this? If I'm going to take a step back, which is what we're doing here, by the way, and ask a larger question than, like, what is the new HEB going to be like? Or why have the Mavericks not guarded the Celtics in this, in this series? Or, like, is there any hope for the Cowboys? Or what, like, whatever. Like, any question that you could ask about modern life. And there are other questions, like, that are more significant in the Dallas sports culture. Like, man, have we lost our minds? Like, where, where are we going? What, what is culture doing? Like, we, we, we can't just, you know, there's all kinds of things you can fill in the blank there with. What is happening? And what I'm asking us to do is to slow down and to zoom out and ask, man, what is the chief end of man? Regardless of all the circumstances, regardless of the fallenness, the Westminster Confession of Faith comes in and says, the chief end of man, the main thing, the chief article is that we would know and glorify God and that we would enjoy him. That we would enjoy and glorify God forever. So you cannot have a knowledge of God without a knowledge of self. That is why you're here. That is why you're here. And the, the good news is that, that, that this is back to the conversation about the story of scripture. The good news here is that like, this is not just me making this up. We're actually, we can actually observe this um, in the scriptures, in the scriptures. And so um, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to go through uh, four or five different things um, that have to do just with 
the story of Scripture. Because, because there's, there's, uh, there, there, there's, there's sort of two primary ways that theologians talk about theology, okay? One of those ways is this. You ask the question, what is God like? What, like, what's the character of God? And the one way is to basically take all of the passages that talk about God and to kind of crunch them together and to put them into a system. Or you can kind of see at a glance, you see, this is what the Bible says about who God is. This is what the Bible teaches about sin. This is what the Bible teaches about sanctification or any topic that you can think of. You see every relevant passage all at once, and this is called systematic theology, which is kind of a, uh, an intimidating term. I, I totally understand that, but that's all that we're doing. It's just saying, like, here are all the relevant passages, and this is what the Bible teaches about, you know, money or about, you know, culture or whatever. There is another way to, to, to think about theology, <clears throat> and that's what we want to talk about today, which is the, the, the it, it's called biblical theology. So you have systematic over here, which is trying to kind of see the, 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 see the, 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 the whole teaching on a particular topic uh, and put, put it all together into this kind of exhaustive teaching on topics. Then you have over here biblical theology, which is awesome. And this is essentially what it is. The Bible's a story. The Bible's a story, and the story has a plot, and this plot has a, it has an initial problem, and then there are, uh, there's an interaction with God and his people, and that, that there's this rising action that, that leads us to a fulfillment, to a climax. And that's what I want us to think about today. And if you're asking yourself, who, uh, not that you're like upset with me or anything, but you're thinking like, why should I care about this? What, it, what is at stake with not doing this, with not heeding or taking the invitation to know God, to know your God through these stories? What I would tell you is that the answer is love is at stake. I would submit to you that, that there is a kind of way that you see the things that God has done for his people. You see the promises that God has made to his people. And you see those things play themselves out over and over and over again. And they take on different dynamics. And there's this thing that's kind of building into this ultimate fulfillment. It's love. It's love. You, 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 you get to a place where you love the story. You love to tell the story. For those who know it best are hungering and are thirsting to hear it like the rest. My question for you before we even begin is, is this true of your heart? Is this true of your heart? Would you say that there is um, a, a growing knowledge? And I, I realize like the stories don't necessarily change, although our interaction with and our perspective on them does change. This reminds me of when I, the, the church that I grew up in. Uh, it's called Smyrna Baptist Church, and it's this little bitty town, uh, Burleson, Tennessee. My, my, my grandmother's maiden name was Burleson, okay? So that's our, that's our place, you know? <laughs> and every year, this church would take this same uh, group of people, basically, and we would uh, pick a random Saturday in July, and we would travel to the Buffalo River uh, uh, east of, or west of Nashville, and um, it was probably a 12 or 13 hour day of just canoeing down this little bitty river. And every single year, what I would do is, I mean, I, you know, that was the only time of the year that like I would get to go to this one particular McDonald's with this giant playground. I don't know if y'all remember these. I guess they all have playgrounds now, basically. And I'm sure the Chick-fil-A's playground is better, but whatever. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I would get to play in this playground, and this was also the only time through the whole year. I, I got one big breakfast from McDonald's per year, and it was always this day. Um, and every time, what I would do is I would get into this water. You go over this little bridge, 
and the same crazy dude at the back would like would would drive us to the to the to the river and we're getting in and every single year i vividly remember thinking oh my gosh this year is the same as last year but different it's the same but kind of different it the river that we're going to go down the route that we're going to that we're going to take the cliffs that i'm going to jump off of like the rope swing, like is it, is it fixed yet? Or like, it's the same as last year, but it's also different. I am now different. And I will go down this river this year as a different person, as a, as a more formed person. So that, that's my invitation. Let's lean in. Let's think about this story together. And let's rejoice in it. Let's hunger and thirst. This is, here's the thing. This is our story. Like we, we as believers in Christ have been grafted into a family. I don't want to steal too much from next week. This is our story. Our story is worth knowing. Every single year, now that it's our little tradition, when we do, when we do the Seder meal, we allude to this and we, we allude to it though as if it's something that someone else gets to do. We get to do it. We get to remember the stories of God's faithfulness. So let's do that. Um, yeah, let's do that. Um, if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 15, uh, that's where we'll start. Um, <clears throat> what, one of the things that you begin to see and notice, if you're thinking from a 30,000 foot view, is that uh, a primary way that God interacts with his people is by, by making promises to them and then over the course of time fulfilling them and keeping them. So he promises something and he fulfills the promise. And so that's what we'll look at. Um, he, uh, another way to say that is that he makes and he enters into a covenant with his people and he keeps the stipulations of the covenant which is not the same as a contract. I don't know if y'all are following that language. A covenant is, uh, is different than a contract in that, um, this is kind of a, a, an old example, but I'll use it here. Let's say, let me see, what's a good example? I'll use Jason's HOA. How about that? He talks about his HOA a lot, and so now I get to talk about it. <clears throat> so when, when Jason agrees like he uh, did, I mean, he actually did agree to, you know, all the things that they, like, require of him, um, when he, does, when he does that, he says, hey, I'll, I'll hold up my end of the deal if you hold up your end of the deal. Like, I'll put in the money and I'll, you know, heed your warnings after the 10th or 12th time. And I'll <laughs> finally, like, you know, take Preston's broken Mustang out of the, you know, like, like I'll, 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 I'll hold up my end if you hold up your end. Um, a covenant is different in, in, this, in this way. It's that the two parties who enter into this agreement, they promise to keep their end of the deal no matter what the other party, the party does. That is significant, y'all. That is significant because here's the thing. God enters into covenant with his own people. Like, what, what is there, what stipulation can God not fulfill? There are none. There are none. And so Genesis 15, what I'll do is allude to Adam and Eve here. So if you remember, Genesis chapter 3, the fall happens. We know from Romans chapter 5 that death entered the world and like, and condemnation through sin entered the world. So now Adam and Eve are now going to be separated from God unless God bridges this gap. And then the Lord promises, this is so powerful, y'all. This is so powerful. This is what I mean when I say you, you learn who God is through these stories because you get to see how God interacts with his people. So the first thing that, the, the, that, 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 that Adam and Eve do, the first thing is they cover themselves and they hide from him. They cover themselves and they hide. And then the Lord pursues after them. He's walking in the cool of the day and he calls out to the man and says, where are you? Does that not reveal something about who God is, who our Father is, it reveals that He pursues us. That He is not indifferent to our distance from Him. 
he comes after us. And he promises then, in that moment, I mean, think about it. He had every right, and he was just in, in sending them away. They broke his commandments. They, they introduced fracture into this relationship. So he was right and just to send them away. And because he is loving, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. To the serpent, he says this. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and between her seed. And this seed that's coming is going to crush your head. We call this the proto-euangelion, the first gospel. This is the first promise like from the very beginning. Okay, so that's, there's that. Then, in Genesis 15, here's what we see. 15 verse 1. So a, couple, a lot has gone on. The flood happened. Tower of Babel happens. And then the Lord, like as if from heaven, he zooms in and he focuses now on this one family. After uh, the Tower of Babel, which is chapter 11 in Genesis, which still concerns mostly the whole world, then we zoom straight into the story of God calling Abram out of the land, and he promises to be faithful. He, like, he is now your Lord and your God. And this is 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham, or to, came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar from Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, <clears throat> and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heavens and the number of the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to them, So shall your offspring be. And he, Abram, believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Amen. So here we see there's a promise that God now is making to this man, Abram, saying, I will be your God, and I, the Lord, will give you descendants as many as the stars are in the heavens. And Abram believed him. He believed the Lord. He had faith in the promises of God, and those, that, that faith was counted as righteousness. And so there's the first kind of pillar here. This is the first huge episode in the story, as far as the covenants are concerned, is that God makes, God enters into a covenant with Abram. So you see that God promises that a seed from the woman will crush the serpent's head. And now to Abram we see, this, this, this nation is going to be big. It's going to be huge. It's going to be as many as the stars are in the heavens. And so we know like what, what, what continues to happen. We follow the story of this family through, through the story of Genesis. So Abraham gives birth to Isaac in Sarah's later years. And then eventually Jacob comes on the scene. And Jacob has how many sons? Twelve sons, that's right. Uh, Benjamin was my favorite. Um, I guess Joseph has to be my favorite, but it's okay. So then, we, then, then uh, Jacob gives birth to Joseph. Uh, Jacob did not give birth to Joseph. Ja Jacob, um, like I said, there's landmines everywhere today. Um, jo uh, Joseph emerges, and this, y'all, when I tell you that if you, if you uh, start thinking about and, and noticing the ways that Scripture is telling the same story, how about this? The Bible says that Joseph... Uh, had great favor in the land, and the whole world came to Joseph for bread. The whole world came to Joseph for bread. How about this? Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which is called the house of bread, who is then the bread of life. So that's for free. <laughs> so then Joseph, Joseph comes on. He has favor in Egypt. He is prominent. The whole, the whole world is saved, essentially, through Joseph preserved through Joseph. And then what happens? The Pharaoh dies, who doesn't know, he, the, the Pharaoh that knew Joseph died, and there arose a new Pharaoh who was evil, who did not know Joseph. And then the people of Israel began to multiply greatly to such a degree that the Pharaoh was kind of concerned about it. And like, like the Lord promised to Abram, 
I'm going to make you a great nation. There are millions and millions and millions of Hebrews, of Israelites in, in Egypt in this time. And then what happens? What happens in the story? God raises up. He raises up Moses. He raises up Moses. And so in, uh, in Exodus chapter 34, this is after... This is after the whole Exodus. I do not want to steal thunder from this fall. We're going to go through Exodus in the fall, and it is going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Um, The ways that the Lord drew, like called out Moses out out of the water, I'm going to call you. And he raises him up, and he delivers his people from the hand of Pharaoh in a miraculous way. He delivers his people. God saves his people. To, to, to the woman, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preserve your seed, and that seed is going to crush the serpent's head. And then to Abram, I'm going to give you descendants, and those descendants are going to be more than the stars in the heavens because of your faith. And then those descendants, they did, they did multiply, and now they're in Pharaoh, and they're enslaved in, into slavery under Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord delivers them from this slavery through a miraculous feature. He brings them through the Red Sea. And then the story continues. And what happens? They do. They go into the land. They go into the promised land. If you were an Israelite living in the land of Cana, what would you be thinking? God has kept all of his promises. This is shalom. This is what, this is what the Lord promised. What, what, would you not be thinking that? You are defeating all the Canaanites, all the different versions of the ites that have these crazy endings. You're, you're doing, you're, you're, you're believing that the fulfillment of these promises that God has made to you, this is them. This is, this is their fulfillment. And yet what happens? Apparently they weren't the fulfillment. Apparently they weren't, they weren't the fulfillment because the peace and the shalom of God that will last forever wasn't on them. And the final one we'll think about today is, um, is one of my favorites. This is 2 Samuel chapter 7. <clears throat> and so the people are, are brought into the land. And then they appoint for themselves judges. And then the last book of the last verse of the book of Judges says that in those days the people were wicked. And they did whatever was right in their own eyes. This is clearly not the fulfillment of the promises of God. The kingdom of God is, is evidently not here yet because this is, not, this is not from the Lord. Then they appointed for themselves kings. But when the people got to pick the kings that they wanted, what, what were the things that they concerned themselves with as it related to the kings? Let's pick the tallest and the most handsome guy. Let, let's, look at, let's look at external realities and assume that that means that we'll be prominent in the land, that he'll have the integrity. And yet we know that, we know this. This is verse 8 in chapter 7. This is, at the, uh, this is near the end of David's life, and he says this. Now therefore, thus you say <clears throat> to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies before you, and I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and you will plant and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and not be disturbed any more. And violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time I, that I appointed judges over my people, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you, the Lord will make you a house, and when your days are fulfilled, you will lie down with your fathers, and I will raise your offspring up after you. You shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He will establish a house for my name, and I will establish his throne. Of the, uh, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, 
and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be sure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. In accordance with all these words, and in accordance with this vision, Nathan spoke to David. And so here we see what is known as the, the covenant with David, the Davidic covenant, where not only does the Lord promise to Eve that he's going he's gonna to crush the serpent's head, not only to Abraham does he promise land and descendants, not only to Moses does he promise that I will be with you and, and you will be my people and I will be your God, that I am the Lord, the Lord, who's abounding in steadfast love and mercy, but who will by no means acquit the guilty. So the law comes in. So we're under, under the law, and the, the law stipulated all kinds of sacrifices and festivals and all kinds of stipulations that the people were to follow now that they were delivered from, from Egypt into the land. And then the final piece comes in, and God says to David, I will put my son on your throne forever. To his kingdom there will be no end. Do you see this picture? Do you see this very quick, relatively speaking, view of the plot of this story? Th this story, it's worth knowing. It's worth knowing. It's worth knowing. It's worth, if we think about back to the moment, it's worth pausing whatever is going on in my life and, and experience today and to avoid looking toward the future and looking back on all of the things that the Lord has done in the past and how he has been faithful to those promises. In fact, this is actually what the Israelites do much more uh, instinctively than we do. So our, our modern orientation to time is that the past is behind us and we're in the present and the future is in front of us. For the Hebrews, that actually isn't the way that they, they see it. For them, the future is behind them. And the past is the thing that they are looking to. They are anchoring their, their, their present moment in the things that the Lord has done for them. Do you see this? Like, I will tell the works of the Lord, the glorious deeds of the Lord, for he established a testimony in Jacob. That, that, that's the why here. Is that if we are not faithful to look back on the promises of God in the past, the things that he has promised, man, no wonder, no wonder we're confused and disoriented and, and uh, there, there's so many things that can just toss us to and fro. The New Testament anticipates this, this reality that we can be tossed to and fro from all kinds of different things that are going on in the world. And there's an invitation to be anchored. Anchored in this story. There are promises of God that have been fulfilled. What I want to do is, is like, man, it, like it, it's, 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 um, it's kind of like this. Like whenever we talk about how, man, the Lord, like the Lord loves you. There's all kinds of things that we, we say and we interact with on a regular basis. And it's like we, we, we fail to, to appreciate the depth of the thing that's being communicated. Are you telling me God loves me? Like, I, I know me. I know myself. Man, I, I struggle to love me. Do, do you not resonate with this? Like, I, like this is unbelievable. This is deeply significant. God loves you. How do you know God loves you? Because the glorious deeds of the Lord have been revealed from the beginning of time until now. He has proven himself over and over and over again. Stud studied by them, like that, that it's, it's an invitation. It's an invitation to, to, to make yourself 
more intimate with the story of God. And so here's how I would love to end this morning. Um, in two places. Uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew and the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And so one of the reasons why I believe that the way that you see uh, the basic kind of skeleton, the backbone of the story of God, the story of Scripture, the story of what we call redemptive history or salvation history or the way that God keeps his promises to his people is because the New Testament kind of uh, emphasizes certain parts of the Old Testament more than others. You kind of hear things like Jesus is the Messiah. And then you look back and there's like particular uh, stories and images that, that kind of come up to your mind uh, when you think about the Messiah. It kind of it, uh, the, the, the technical term is connotation. Like it, it connotates certain stories. <clears throat> and so the, the genealogy of Jesus, for most of us, we just kind of gloss through it. I mean, if we're honest, like I gloss straight through the, the genealogies. What I want you to see is, is the beginning of this passage is meant to, to, to say something very specific to a first century audience that would have known these stories, known these families, known these people, would have been able to trace the families and the stories to the promises of God. So that's the context for this first sentence. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. That is so powerful, y'all. That is so powerful. He's here. He's here. We know the climax of this story. We know the climax of the story. And I know, like, it's like a total Sunday school thing. Like, of course, the answer is Jesus. What I'm telling you is that the point of the promise, like, imagine the history Imagine the longing, imagine the difficulty, the strife, all of the years in Egypt. All of the years in bondage. The, 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 the 40 years through the wilderness. And then the struggle to set up the tabernacle and to like live in fear that you're like not keeping any of the 613 laws. And then you realize that, that there's a promise that there's a royal son who's going to sit on the throne forever and, and, and he's going to usher in this kingdom and we're going to be a part of it and it's going to be awesome. And then, guess what? He does show up and Matthew communicates, I am here to testify, to tell you of this story, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. He's the son of Abraham and he's the son of David. It jumps off the page at you when you're seeing the Bible as a unified story. He is the fulfillment of all the promises of God. And he even says this of himself. This is how, this is how we'll end. Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> Starting in verse, uh, in verse 14. Now after John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now repent and believe the gospel. Uh, one of the one of the best parts and one of my favorite parts about this church is how how connected to and how central the gospel is in our in our in our worship services and in our small groups and we want to be about the gospel here. And I, what 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 I just want to remind you is that um, and I this is in some ways a reminder for myself 
the gospel is news. It's news. It's not anything else. It's, it's news. It's not advice. It's not rules. I want to encourage you with that today. The genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David, Jesus comes on the scene and says, the time is fulfilled. Here I am. My father, the Lord, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who was in the garden with the, the, the first couple who made the promises himself, who then was faithful by day and by night to the people of Israel through the wilderness, the one who promised to David, I will put my son on your throne forever. That time is now fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. So here, here's how I'd love to turn our time to communion. Let's remember, saints, the story of Scripture. God will save his people. He will save his people. And that news is like the hymn says, where the more you hear it, the more you want to hear it. It never gets old. It never gets old. It does, you do change you do take a different pass down the same river again, and I'm inviting you now to remember the story. God has saved his people. Repent and believe in the gospel. Believe it. Believe it. Live into it as if it's the true story of the world, which it is. So let's do that together. Let's pray. <clears throat> And so, God, we do, we just, um, we just say thank you. We thank you that you have made yourself known. We thank you that you, uh, even now, you just, you reveal who you are to us. We thank you that you pursue us, that you have uh, left your throne and you've dwelt among us. And we have seen your glory. Glory as the only Son from the Father. We thank you that you are full of grace for us today. We thank you that you're full of truth today. So now as we turn towards this time, would your Spirit just um, convince us of the, the mercy and the grace and the provision of Christ for our salvation? Would we now turn towards him and, and, and dine with him? We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. We're going to continue in our service through communion this morning. And uh, if you are a believer in Jesus, you don't have to be a member of Lighthouse Church to um, partake in communion this morning. We want to invite you to do so today. And if you are questioning uh, the story today that was told, and you're not really sure if Jesus is Lord of your life, we want to ask you to abstain today, but we would love the opportunity to introduce you to him this morning. As we uh, begin our time of communion, go ahead and take your elements and open up the bread side first. This is more than a ritual. Uh, this is an ordinance. This is an act of worship. And so today, as Daniel shared this morning, we remember as Jesus taught us to every time that we do gather to partake and remember what Jesus did for us. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, remember this was written to them, but it was written for us. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Church, let's eat.
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, let's drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this reminder that we have today. How we're welcome to the table and how we remember what you did for us on the cross by taking our place, becoming sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through the forgiveness of sins. Your blood was poured out and shed for for the forgiveness of many sins. Past, present, future sins, all forgiven. God, we thank you for what you did through your son, Jesus, that we can stand before you today and call you Father, that we are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.